Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. On December 26th, 1996, a man was driving down the highway in a southern part of Bear County, Texas, just outside the city of San Antonio, when he noticed something strange. He had just finished lunch and was heading back to work at his electrical contracting company when he spotted a bluish-gray minivan at the side of the road. The vehicle looked like it had a flat tire, but the driver was nowhere to be found. After pulling over to investigate, it dawned on the man that he recognized the abandoned minivan. It belonged to one of his employees, a 32-year-old receptionist named Patty Vaughn. Upon realizing this, for a moment, things seemed to make sense. Patty hadn't arrived at work at the usual time that morning, and her co-workers had been wondering where she was. That being said, it was the day after Christmas, and things weren't exactly running on their usual schedule. In either case, since the office was only another two miles down the road, Patty's boss assumed that she had run into car troubles and had simply decided to try and walk the rest of the way. However, when the boss arrived back at work, he would soon learn that Patty was not there. In fact, no one had seen her since the previous day. It turned out that what the man had stumbled across was one of the only major clues in what would quickly become a terrifying and frustrating missing persons case. This is the story of Patty Vaughn, the woman who vanished without a trace on Christmas Day. From the outside looking in, it seemed that Patty and J.R. Vaughn were the perfect couple. The pair first met at a local San Antonio burger joint where Patty worked as a server and soon hit it off. They married a couple of years later in 1985 and went on to have three children. Patty was a devout Christian and a talented singer who had been in love with music from the time that she was very young. J.R. owned a construction contracting business and was able to provide a good life for his family. The couple moved around to several states at first, but eventually settled in the small city of Lavernia, Texas, close to where they had first gotten to know each other. There, they settled into a comfortable routine. J.R. continued working on his construction business, while Patty was a stay-at-home mom. In addition to taking care of the kids, she got extremely involved with her local United Methodist Church, where she joined the choir and also performed regularly with the Christian folk band she had started called Prism. However, despite the image that Patty and J.R. kept up, after a while, their relationship ran into trouble. It's not clear exactly what the problems between them were, but it's said that Patty in particular was unhappy. Some sources we came across in our research state that much of the tension in the marriage was due to J.R.'s controlling behavior. They further allege that Patty was forbidden from working outside their home, and that J.R. would often make insulting and demeaning comments towards her. Though Patty absolutely loved her children and was willing to do anything for them, by the fall of 1996, she realized that the problems in her marriage were too big to simply continue on. It appeared that J.R. agreed, and so after 11 and a half years, they made the choice to go through with a trial separation. As part of this agreement, J.R. moved out of the family home and into an apartment in San Antonio. Patty, meanwhile, stayed with the children in Lavernia, and for the first time in years, rejoined the workforce landing a job at a company called Quinney Electric. Though the separation was hardly something to celebrate as far as Patty was concerned, within just a short time of it beginning in October of that year, those close to her sensed an immediate change. For the first time in what it felt like forever, the 32-year-old mother seemed happy and enthusiastic about life. In the run-up to Christmas, Patty revealed to one of her sisters that there had been another exciting development in her life. She had reconnected with an old boyfriend named Gary. Patty had first met Gary back in 1982, when she was 18 and still living with her family. The two had fallen hard for each other and had been in a serious relationship for several months, but things abruptly ended after Gary was approached by an ex-girlfriend who told him that she was pregnant. Out of a feeling of obligation to his ex and their child, Gary had broken things off with Patty. She had always been devastated by the end of the relationship, 
but now it seemed like they might have a second chance. Shortly after the separation from JR, Patty learned that Gary had recently gotten divorced. In the meantime, it seemed that things were remaining amicable between Patty and JR. On Christmas Eve, they attended church as a family, where Patty performed as part of the annual Christmas celebration. When the service ended, they split up once again, but had plans to meet up the following day. They decided that for the sake of normalcy and tradition, it would be best if JR still came over to the family home to do the usual Christmas morning routine with the children. With that, Patty and the kids headed over to her Aunt Jean's house for a Christmas Eve get-together. While Patty was excited to meet up with her family for the usual holiday reasons, for her, the night was also tinged with a different sort of nervous anticipation as well. For the first time, she formally introduced Gary as her new boyfriend. Initially nervous as to how the relationship would be received, Patty instead found that her family was incredibly supportive. They were just happy to see that for the first time in a long time, she seemed genuinely happy. When things wrapped up around midnight in the usual flurry of hugs and goodbyes, everyone said that they would see each other soon. Sadly, for Patty, this couldn't have been further from the truth. As previously mentioned, on Christmas morning, Patty and JR had made arrangements for him to come over to the house and spend time with her and the children. After unwrapping presents and taking part in their usual holiday routines, the plan was to have some of JR's family members over at the house in the afternoon. After that, JR would go his own way while Patty dropped the kids off at her Aunt Jean's house for the evening. If all went well, she would get to spend some time with Gary. The two had tentatively planned to see a movie together, while Jean and Patty's cousins Kathy and Barb looked after the kids. However, as afternoon turned to evening that Christmas day, there was no sign of Patty at her aunt's house. Not only that, but she never called to cancel either. This was a bit concerning, but Jean, Kathy, and Barb told themselves that maybe things had just run a little late with JR's side of the family. It wasn't until the following evening that all of that would change when Kathy received a phone call from JR. Terrifyingly, he said that no one had seen or heard from Patty in nearly 24 hours. JR explained that the previous day he had come over to the family home in Lavernia as planned, but that at some point Patty had gotten angry with him. He claimed that she stormed out of the house during the middle of an argument and had driven off almost immediately afterwards. He said that at first he wasn't concerned because he assumed Patty was with her new boyfriend. That's when JR dropped another bombshell. Earlier that day, at around 1.30 p.m., Patty's bluish-gray 1991 Dodge Caravan had been found at the side of Loop 1604, the outer highway that encircles the city of San Antonio. The van was discovered by Patty's boss along her route to work, about 15 miles away from the family home and about two miles from her office. The vehicle looked like it had a flat tire, but there was no sign of Patty anywhere. The keys and purse she had taken with her when leaving the house also could not be found at the scene. JR said he had taken an extra set of keys for the vehicle down to the place where the van had been left and had given them to Patty's boss, who had moved it to their office so it could be properly investigated. As soon as Kathy got off the phone with JR, she told Barb and Jean what was going on, before immediately phoning Gary. To their horror, he seemed just as surprised and concerned as they were. He said that he hadn't seen Patty at all on Christmas Day. She had never called him. The last time they had been together was Christmas Eve, the same time that the rest of Patty's family had seen her as well. Now extremely worried, Kathy, Barb, and Jean contacted the Bear County Sheriff's Office to report Patty's disappearance. To their frustration, they were told that it was too soon to file a missing persons report. Since it hadn't been 72 hours and Patty was an adult, there was nothing they could do. The family members insisted that Patty was a devout Christian and a loving mother who never would have abandoned her three children. Unfortunately, police said, there was no proof that she hadn't simply left of her own accord. Unable to simply sit and wait, 
Kathy went out to the place where Patty's minivan had been found and started to look around in the dark with a flashlight. In the meantime, Jean started calling other family members to see if maybe anyone else had heard from Patty. Both of these tactics initially came up empty until Jean got a hold of Patty's youngest sister, Jeannie, who was living in Georgia at the time. Because Jeannie knew she wasn't going to see her sister over the holidays, she had instead called to wish her a Merry Christmas the previous day. Jeannie told her aunt that she had phoned at around 10.30 a.m. Texas time and that J.R. had answered. When he put Patty on the phone, she pretended to have a cold, but Jeannie could immediately tell that this was an excuse. It was obvious that she had been crying. Jeannie had previously lived with J.R. and Patty and was close to both of them. She asked what was wrong, and Patty explained that she and her estranged husband had been arguing. Though Jeannie had been concerned, Patty reassured her that everything was fine. She said that fighting was nothing out of the ordinary between the two of them these days anyway. While Patty's conversation with Jeannie didn't reveal much, it did show that Patty had at least been at her home on Christmas morning. It also suggested that the fighting between her and J.R. had been far less spontaneous than he had described, and had actually been going on all day. Early on December 27th, now nearly two days after Patty went missing, her cousins Barb and Kathy went to her workplace to take a look at her recovered minivan. What they found there disturbed them even more. When they examined the so-called flat tire on her vehicle, they noticed that they couldn't find an actual puncture mark. Instead, it appeared that the air had simply been let out of the tire. In other words, it had been intentionally deflated, suggesting that the roadside scene that Patty's boss had come across the previous day had been staged. With this information in hand, the cousins recontacted police, who now agreed to open an investigation before the normal 72-hour window had passed. When they arrived at Quinny Electric, they quickly confirmed that there was nothing wrong with the flat tire on Patty's van. They were able to reinflate it perfectly, and it held its pressure. When investigators began combing the interior of the minivan, something else almost immediately stuck out to them. The vehicle was extremely clean, suspiciously so. This was a van that was regularly used to drive around three children, yet it looked like it had just been deep cleaned with detergent and water. In fact, multiple areas of the interior were still wet. Believing that blood might be present, the van was swabbed and was sent away for further testing. It was also dusted for fingerprints. Though the vehicle appeared to have been wiped clean, a single set of fingerprints were recovered. They did not belong to Patty, and authorities would later learn that they were not a match to anyone in local or federal databases either. One thing that did seem out of place were a pile of men's clothes that were found inside the van. Among the clothes was a red workman's jumpsuit, which was described as something that a mechanic or a plumber might wear. On the back were the initials JM in white. While awaiting the results of further testing on the van, a search effort was organized to try and find Patty. Thanks to local and state news coverage, the family was able to amass a team of more than 500 volunteers to come out and take part. The search effort was focused on the area around where Patty's van had been discovered, but several areas of interest were further explored by police and canine units. This included a small pond, roughly 50 feet wide and 3 feet deep, that was well hidden off of the side of the highway. The pond was dragged, but nothing of interest was recovered. Unfortunately, the same was true of everywhere else police and volunteers looked. And on December 29th, the official search was ended. With all efforts to locate Patty unsuccessful, police turned their attention towards the people in the missing woman's life. Immediately, there were three areas of interest to start. Suspicions first turned to Gary, as he was the new man in Patty's life. During interviews, detectives learned that on Christmas Day, Gary had actually driven by Patty's Lavernia home, even though they hadn't made plans to see each other until later that evening. He was out with his sister for a leisurely drive at the time and asked if they could pass by. They apparently did this, though did not stop or try to go inside. 
However, Gary did tell police that at the time, both JR and Patty's vehicles were on the home's driveway. He said that the kids were also playing out front. In terms of Gary's possible involvement in Patty's disappearance, investigators speculated that maybe when he saw the Vaughn family together, he got jealous. Worried about a possible reconciliation of the marriage, perhaps he had decided to make sure that couldn't happen. However, investigators quickly backed off of this line of speculation. For starters, the jealousy theory didn't really make much sense. According to basically everyone around Patty, it was pretty clear that she was excited about the prospect of being with Gary. Secondly, Gary had a solid alibi. He was with family members for the entirety of Christmas Day, even when he supposedly drove past Patty's house. Lastly, his actions upon finding out that Patty was missing did not seem like those of a person with something to hide. According to Patty's own family members, he seemed genuinely stunned when informed that she was missing and was the first person to offer to help in any way he could. He was there for nearly all of the searches that they conducted and helped to pass out flyers with Patty's photo and information on them once the search concluded. Finally, Gary voluntarily submitted to a polygraph test when first approached by police, which he easily passed. With Gary not seeming like he had anything to do with Patty's disappearance, authorities next entertained a more nebulous possibility that someone in the community may have had a problem with Patty and Gary's relationship. This was hardly something police pulled out of thin air. To the contrary, the fact that Patty had been dating had caused quite a stir in the local community. It had started a couple of weeks earlier, on December 13th, when a male member of Patty's church had seen her and Gary out for lunch together at a local Dairy Queen. Believing that it was improper for Patty to be out to lunch with another man because she was still married to JR, the man had reported Patty to the minister of their church. A few days later, the minister had called Patty out in front of everyone at choir practice, shaming her and saying that she did not deserve to represent the church because of her so-called immoral behavior. This had reportedly snowballed to the point where several people in the community hadn't been shy about telling Patty about what they thought about her, and police wondered if it might have spiraled into something more sinister. That being said, though it was clear that the gossiping and public shaming had been humiliating for Patty, no more concrete evidence emerged to suggest that something like this had happened. That left one final, obvious person of interest, Patty's estranged husband, J.R. Vaughn. When detectives first spoke to J.R., he told them more or less the same story that he had first told to Patty's cousin over the phone. He said that they had gotten together on Christmas morning and they had fought, leading Patty to eventually storm out of the house. In his estimation, he told investigators, whatever had happened to his wife had happened after she had left the family home. However, by speaking to several other people around J.R., police were able to develop a fuller picture of not only the day of the disappearance, but of J.R.'s alleged actions afterwards. For starters, there was the fact that Patty allegedly spent most of Christmas Day locked in her bedroom, something that her family members say would have been extremely out of character for her, especially if people were coming over. In fact, some family members told police that they had stopped by at some point on Christmas, but were told by JR that they couldn't see Patty because she was in her bedroom and wasn't feeling well. Unfortunately, reports are a bit fuzzy on this specific detail, as it's not clear whether it was members of JR's family or Patty's family that made the claim that they weren't allowed to see her. Still, we thought this was worth mentioning because it came up in nearly every source we came across in our research. What we do know, though, is that later that afternoon, rather than hosting JR's family as previously planned, JR had asked his sister Marilyn to instead take the children to their younger sister's place. Marilyn had done as he had asked, ostensibly leaving just J.R. and Patty alone together, and meaning that he definitely would have been the last person to see her before she went missing. Then, there was J.R.'s behavior following the disappearance. According to Patty's family, unlike Gary, J.R. never helped with any of the searches for his wife. 
This was apparently despite the fact that he kept in constant contact with several people he knew on the ground, allegedly taking great interest in where volunteers and police would be looking next. When asked, JR explained that there were two reasons he didn't help out. One, he wanted to be at home to look after his children, and two, he had apparently been advised by a police officer that if something related to the case should be found during the search, he didn't want his DNA anywhere near it. That being said, Patty's family claimed this didn't explain all of JR's behavior. For example, they stated he had lied about handing out a stack of missing persons flyers, which were allegedly later found to still be at the family home. There was more, though. When Patty's boss had called JR to inform him that he had found her minivan, JR allegedly first told him that he wouldn't be able to come and see the vehicle because he was on his way to officially file for divorce. Keep in mind, Patty had been missing for less than 24 hours at this point. JR did eventually agree to meet the boss and drop off the spare keys, but apparently did this on his way to file the divorce papers raising red flags in the minds of Patty's family further. Though JR had only been supposed to visit on Christmas, he had effectively moved back into the family home that day. Not only that, he had erased Patty's outgoing answering machine message and replaced it with his own. He did this just two days after she disappeared. Perhaps most bizarre of all, according to a letter that was uncovered as part of the investigation, J.R. had written to his landlord to break the lease on his apartment. This letter was dated two days before Patty went missing. To Patty's family, it seemed that J.R. knew something that the rest of them didn't. When J.R. spoke to police, he offered explanations for all of this. He said that none of the details regarding his move back into the house had been planned. Instead, he claimed that this had been the result of his fight with Patty on Christmas Day. J.R. stated that after learning that Patty was seeing Gary, he had gotten angry. He felt that the relationship was inappropriate and that he didn't want this man he didn't know near his kids. The argument had escalated to the point of threats, during which J.R. said he decided he would stand his ground. He said that he told Patty that he was going to try and take the house back and could probably make it so that she would never see her kids again as well. After Patty stormed out of the house, JR said that he had moved back in as a way to show that he was willing to follow through on his threat. He stated that this is what filing for divorce the next day had been about as well. It was an ultimatum tactic. He said he was really trying to push Patty into getting back together. As for the letter to his landlord, J.R. claimed that was purely a coincidence. He just didn't like the area where his apartment was and said that he didn't feel safe there. Despite these explanations, detectives were still suspicious of J.R. As part of their investigation, they requested access to the family home in order to search it for evidence the same way they were doing with Patty's minivan. J.R. granted this request, and several days after Patty's disappearance, a forensics team began to work their way through the house. During this search, investigators would find several areas of concern, most of which were in or adjacent to the master bedroom. Interestingly, just like the van, the room showed signs of having recently been heavily cleaned. Despite this, luminol tests revealed the number of places where blood might be. In a closet, in the room's adjoining bathroom, and in the master bedroom itself. A mop and bucket in the garage also tested positive under luminol. Just like with the van, police took swabs in all of these areas and sent them off for testing. Several months later, in April of 1997, the results of both the van and the samples taken from the house finally came back. As investigators suspected, blood was found in both places, and all of the samples were a match to Patty Vaughn. At this point, you might be thinking that this is where the case was blown wide open. Patty's family certainly didn't need more convincing. Two months earlier, her mother had broken into JR's home in the middle of the night and attacked him with a baseball bat. Incidentally, she was charged, though the case would never be brought to trial. Unfortunately, though, far from being resolved, 
This is where things began to take a turn for the worse in the Patty Vaughn investigation. By far the biggest problem police reportedly faced was the lack of a body. Though it was widely feared that Patty had been the victim of foul play, without any sort of remains, it was difficult to say for sure. This was especially true given that the case happened in the state of Texas. As detectives would later state in interviews, when it comes to investigations like this, the state mantra is no body, no crime. The one thing that might have helped overcome this hurdle would have been the blood evidence. Unfortunately, with such small quantities recovered in both the van and the Vaughn home, it wasn't enough to prove that a violent crime had occurred. It was certainly suspicious, but it fell far short of being enough to bring charges against JR, or anyone else for that matter. In addition to this, there were alleged bureaucratic problems and procedural errors that further hampered the investigation. Because Patty lived in Lavernia, which is in Wilson County, but her vehicle was found in Bear County, there were apparently jurisdictional issues. This reportedly led to the case being tossed back and forth at the beginning, causing confusion. Patty's family further alleges that vital evidence was jeopardized by the fact that the Vaughn family home was never officially cordoned off as a crime scene. In the time Patty went missing to the time police searched for the blood evidence, people had been living in the house constantly. In fact, according to sources we came across in our research, J.R. and his sister Marilyn were present while the forensics team was processing the house for clues. At several points, Marilyn allegedly interrupted investigators, peppering them with questions and becoming so disruptive that the team was forced to leave and come back another day to finish gathering evidence. It was apparently around this time that J.R. stopped talking to investigators altogether, hiring an attorney and cutting off all further contact with police. With no solid evidence against their only real person of interest in the case, police mined the last few leads that they had, hoping for a breakthrough. The most promising of these tips were about the possible location of Patty's remains. In particular, it was pointed out that JR's construction company had been contracted to work on two different elementary schools in the San Antonio area around the time of Patty's disappearance. Because JR had been personally involved in pouring the concrete for these buildings, it was suggested that this might have been where her remains were hidden. Bear with us here, because this next bit is kind of confusing, and in our research appeared to be an area full of disagreements and contradictions. What we know for sure is that in May of 1997, a team of investigators used ground-penetrating radar at one of the elementary schools in the city of Pleasanton. At multiple points of interest, they bored holes in the concrete and brought cadaver dogs in to see if they could detect the presence of human remains. Officially, it appears the results were inconclusive, but other reports state that nothing of interest was found. Patty's family, meanwhile, insists that there were irregularities found in the concrete on the radar, but that these were never properly investigated due to the financial cost, plus a lack of will on the part of local officials, who didn't want to have to essentially destroy a significant part of a brand new building on the suspicion that there might be a body buried there. While it appears that further searches have been done at both of these former construction sites in the years since, according to reports, nothing of note has ever been found. Of course, these appear to have been even more cursory searches, so if Patty really was hidden at either of these locations, it seems doubtful that she actually would have been found. According to the most recent reports we could find, several of Patty's family members remain convinced to this day that she is buried at one of these two locations. While Patty's family members have kept up the search for her in the years since, sadly, it seems that they have been met with disappointment at every turn. As no charges were ever brought against J.R., he was granted full custody of his three children and eventually left the state altogether. When he did, he reportedly cut Patty's family off from seeing the children forever and also changed his name. In 2005, J.R. had Patty legally declared dead and reportedly attempted to collect her life insurance money. Patty's family responded by filing a wrongful death lawsuit against him. The case was settled at the end of that year. 
while it was ruled that the insurance money would be held in trust for Patty's children, all claims against J.R. were denied. While Patty's family members, particularly her cousins Kathy and Barb, say that they have not and will never give up on finding out what happened to her, with each passing day, the mystery only seems to deepen. Speaking of which, now seems as good a time as any to talk about some of the more mysterious details of the case. Perhaps the most bizarre of these is the red jumpsuit with the initials JM on them that were found in Patty's van. As far as we can tell, no explanation was ever given as to why these might have been there or who police think they may have belonged to. Another strange detail pertaining to the case has to do with the mysterious movements of Patty's van. According to reports, before the vehicle was found by Patty's boss, at least two of her co-workers had traveled down that same section of road and later told police that the van was not there at the time. Even stranger, some reports we came across state that an anonymous caller to police claimed that their friend had seen the minivan on the evening of Christmas Day, right around the time when Patty is alleged to have gone missing. Once again, the caller stated that the friend had seen the van pulled over on the same section of road where it was later found, only this time it was not abandoned. The caller claimed that the friend had seen a white male exit the vehicle and began running away from it, only to stop and turn back as if they had forgotten something. Was this tip legitimate? If so, who was this person? Unfortunately, we just don't know. In 2008, investigators added their own mysterious twist to the case when they reported that they now had reason to believe that three or more people could have been involved in the incident. At the time, they cited the level of apparent precision in planning that went into Patty's disappearance, but stopped short of identifying any potential suspects. Four years later, yet another wrench was thrown into the case, when the Bear County Sheriff's Office announced new DNA findings in the investigation. They claimed that they had found DNA in the minivan that did not belong to Patty. But here's the thing, it belonged to another woman. This time, police went as far as to say that they were pretty sure they knew who the DNA belonged to, but once again, they stopped short of identifying them by name. As if to throw metaphorical cold water on the fire they had just started, they also stated that even if they were correct in their assumptions, they did not have enough evidence to meet the standards of probable cause to obtain a DNA sample from this person. That being said, given all of the research we've done up until this point, we think we have a guess as to who this person was. Keep in mind, we are in wild speculation territory now, and none of this should be taken very seriously. But we personally wonder if police thought the woman's DNA belonged to JR's sister Marilyn. After all, it wouldn't be the first time that a family member helped to cover up a crime. And according to reports, she was both at the Vaughn house on the day Patty disappeared, and was also disruptive when police tried to gather blood evidence later on. We want to reiterate, though, that this is a wild guess, and we definitely wouldn't put any kind of stock behind it. It's just the kind of weird thought you can't help but have after reading about this frustrating case non-stop for days on end. Anyway, while police insist that they are still investigating, as far as we can tell, this was more or less the last major update shared with the public. This is with the exception of yet another dig that was carried out in 2014 at the Vaughn's former Lavernia home. However, as you may have guessed by now, this also failed to turn up any new evidence. At the time of this recording, we are just days away from the 26th anniversary of Patty's disappearance, and with each passing year, the window of opportunity for getting justice in this case seems to close a little bit more. Some, like Patty's boyfriend Gary, are sadly no longer around, and according to an article from last year, her elderly mother is quite sick as well. More than anything, we hope that the family will soon get the closure they deserve. If you or anyone you know has information related to the disappearance of Patty Vaughn, please contact the Bear County Sheriff's Office. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a minute to thank our amazing supporters over on Patreon. As many of you are aware, our situation on YouTube always seems to be a bit uncertain, 
but our patrons help to ensure that we can continue to make content like this long term without having to worry as much about what surprises might be thrown our way. Plus, patrons also get access to four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. If you'd like to help support the channel directly, head over to patreon.com slash crimezone to join. You can also find that link in the description below. As always, thank you so much for watching, and take care.